All right, let's cover back pain today. It's one of the more common things we see in primary care, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you haven't suffered back pain at some point in your lives. Let's discuss it from an evidence-based perspective. And we're gonna start with a case. I've got a construction worker coming in with back pain. He's 35 years old, male. He complains of back pain for the past five days. He works in construction, was lifting a 50 kilogram bag when he felt acute pain in his lower back. The pain has since improved, but he still has occasional radiculopathy that goes down his right leg. No previous history of back injury. So what's the next best step in his care? Just knowing that, that baseline history there. Is it getting an MRI or plain radiographs? Uh, is it just doing a physical examination and following up with analgesics? Or should we think about referring to an orthopedist? The answer is C, physical examination and analgesics alone. Of course you want to do a physical examination, but we'll talk about how the natural history of most cases of back pain, even if it feels fairly severe at first and is associated with radiculopathy, still usually resolves within a couple months. So overall, the point prevalence at any one time among adults of uh, back pain is 12%, whereas the one month prevalence is 23%. And then 85% of patients in primary care have, a, have some kind of low back pain at some point in their lives. And it's oftentimes related to overuse and rep repetitive minor trauma, but we certainly see cases like this one as well, uh, where it was either uh, due to a, um, an accident uh, at work or a motor vehicle accident or something more severe. So, some key diagnoses to rule out and think about when you see patients with low back pain specifically uh, include cauda equina syndrome. Cauda equina is a back pain that's also associated with specific neurological symptoms. That includes saddle anesthesia and the problems with uh, bowel and bladder. Now that can mean a couple things. It can be, classically it's thought of as incontinence, but actually retention of stool and urine is more common in cauda equina syndrome uh, than incontinence. So that's something to think about. The saddle anesthesia though has to be there to define cauda equina syndrome. And because that's an acute compression of the nerve roots, it does require an emergent evaluation by a surgeon. The other three diagnoses generally present with more uh, persistent pain, more severe pain, when you're talking about things like cancer, abscess, and osteomyelitis, and particularly the latter two may, or I'm sorry, may be associated with more of a fever uh, with abscess or osteomyelitis than you might see. But in those cases that aren't getting better, that aren't for, you know, following that natural course, um, thinking about these diagnoses can be helpful and, and then getting early imaging and follow-up. But they are very rare compared to the wide array of cases we see of back pain due to repetitive injury or minor trauma. Uh, cases of things like osteomyelitis or cancer are incredibly rare. So, you know, one of the questions is, well, what about imaging? Why not get start with x-rays? Why not start with MRI? And the question I would pose back is, does that really change your management in most cases of low back pain? And in fact, uh, in clinical studies, uh, early imaging isn't associated with a difference in clinical status at 12 months. And then you have to consider just how common changes, particularly the lumbar spine, are as we get older. So by age 60 years, um, up to two-thirds of adults uh, have evidence of disc herniation on MRI, and about one in five has evidence of spinal stenosis. So it's the rare 60-year-old who, who has actually a normal MRI of the lumbar spine. So everybody has something. But the fact is that those degenerative changes don't necessarily correlate well at all uh, with the degree of pain and disability among patients. So therefore, that's, those are the limitations of imaging. Like a lot of things in orthopedics with imaging, I really think about getting imaging when we're going to do something about the uh, pain and disability, uh, such as uh, considering injection therapy or even surgery. That's the time to order imaging, not in an early stage uh, when you still want to give conservative management a good try. What is that management? Well, certainly it's analgesics. We've talked about those a number of times. I start with acetaminophen for safety uh, and then move up to non anti-inflammatory drugs and try to keep it uh, safe and simple with those agents. Um, physical therapy is probably the best means to prevent the development of chronic low back pain, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's not as much um, evidence to support the use of uh, massage or spinal manipulation for the majority of patients with low back pain. It doesn't seem to add much to just traditional medical management with analgesics. 
and bed rest is certainly not recommended. You want these patients mobile and starting to do a regimen of rehabilitation with stretching and strengthening exercises uh, to improve their current um, back pain, but also to prevent chronic low back pain as well. So, hey, the case is coming back, as many, as many cases of back pain do. He returns nine months later. His back pain has now become chronic, and he has moderate difficulty in many activities. Um, he's tried to look for another type of work, um, you know, because it is difficult to be in, in physical work like construction with chronic back pain. Luckily, his radiculopathy has resolved. So one thing I would note in the history here, just be very, uh, I, I think it's very important that there is an assessment, not just for his level of pain, but also his function. Uh, we are moving towards a system where it's not so much just about treating the number of pain. Well, my pain is a 4 out of 10 and mine is an 8 out of 10. It's really about how does that affect you in your life because a 4 out of 10 pain can be absolutely debilitating to somebody who works in a physical job like construction. But for uh, someone who's more sedentary, uh, they maybe the, and they don't really have as, as many physical activities. Um, they may be able to tolerate a 6 out of 10 or even a 7 out of 10 pain uh, because it's not interfering with their lifestyle at all. But the question here is, how common is this case? What percentage of cases of acute back pain become chronic? The answer is 20%. Approximately 20% of low back pain becomes chronic. And when I see a patient with chronic back pain, you know, first thing I'm going to look at is what are they doing in terms of current therapy and its efficacy? Maybe they improved after one round of physical therapy that was pretty short, and then they kind of forgot about it because, hey, I feel better, and that's, that's what you do. Um, and maybe it's time they can go back and restart those exercises and re, you know, regain that confidence in, in getting their back pain under control. And then, of course, looking at medications, too. So you're going to look at the analgesics, look at uh, whether they've been doing physical therapy, but particularly home exercise. I think one of the most important parts about physical therapy is they can teach patients how to take care of themselves at home. So if it's, if it's just four sessions, um, it's, it's likely that there are going to be more problems down the road. But if patients are able to continue those therapeutic exercises over time, that makes a big difference. Look at function, as I mentioned, I, that's, that's a big factor. And overall, if treatment isn't working, and you see decreased function, that's when I consider imaging, as I mentioned earlier, and it's time to think about doing something a little bit more aggressive and invasive. And so less commonly, my, many patients don't require this, but, um, but they have been employed uh, for many years and are you know, often in that, the next step in care after just simple analgesics, exercise, physical therapy fails, are epidural glucocorticoid injections. Now, they don't work that well for nonspecific uh, low back pain, but for pain that includes disability, pain with radiculopathy, uh, these injections can be effective. Unfortunately, it's usually a fairly temporary relief, lasting three months or less. Uh, one thing is that these, uh, these injections should always be applied with imaging. Um, it's been studied, and uh, those that don't use imaging are, are frequently misplaced, therefore may be ineffective and potentially even dangerous. There is a limit as well to how many injections per year. This isn't a strong evidence-based guideline, uh, but the general consensus is certainly uh, up to six injections a year is a lot, and I, I generally don't want my patients to go in more than four times. Um, and in these injections also aren't very effective for cases of spinal stenosis as well. So with that, hopefully, this is a, a broader view of an important subject. Uh, just understand that low back pain is out there. It's pretty common. But the conservative therapy is going to work. Uh, and about 80% of patients will improve, even with severe you know, pain and radiculopathy at the beginning. 80% will get better within a couple months. So you can be confident in that. Um, Many cases, one in five or so, uh, do become chronic, and that's when it's time to think, rethink about home exercises and analgesics, and then also consider imaging and more aggressive therapy as well. Thanks. <music>